here and the recording is going to start. It's also for, if you don't wanna show your face, you can just turn off your camera. If you're comfortable, then you can keep it on. And uh, the, the recordings are always on the D25 site. For those of you who've missed it, you can always um, send it to someone else to log on and can view it there. Um, I don't see anyone here from the board other than myself and Christine. Oh, hey, hi, Christine. Party of two. <laughs> So um, so every month we have these meetings to kind of support our PTAs and to any questions that you may have or anything that has arisen in your school and just, you know, um, anything successful that's happening in your school, definitely share with us so we can share with our other schools. We are a, a very good district and we want to keep it that way. And so it, it wouldn't be so good without the parent leaders like yourself. So I want to thank you tonight for being here. And we're going to start It's 635 and we're going to start our meeting. Um, before we start, I don't see the superintendent here yet, so we won't start. Um, she'll be, she, she wants to, she requested if she could be a little late. She's, um, so oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot. All right. So we have our other speakers here tonight that we have a lot of speakers tonight. Um, but before we move on, I just wanted to bring up something that was brought up to me at a CPAC level. And uh, um, it is something that has been going on and there's an actual, uh, it's a movement that's happening with CPAC and CPAC is, for those of you who don't know, is the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Board. And what some a representative there, and most people are asking, I know there's a big um, disconnect with us getting parent information when you know parents first come to the school and sometimes it makes PTAs very difficult to do business like PTA business because we don't have everyone's um, name or contact info or phone number. So someone has contacted me from, you know, one voting member from another district who's actually creating a movement of trying to see if, if, if in the future it, this can be changed so that PTAs can get this information. So I'm just bringing it here tonight at this forum to get some feedback of what you think, you know, um, how this may benefit us as PTAs in our district. So if anyone wants to chime in and give a little feedback on it. Anyone? Or any, uh, yes, Janet. Hi, how is everybody? Good and you. This is Janet. I'm from PS 107. I'm the PTA president. Um, <clears throat> are you are you talking about? Um, you're just you just mean like the contact information of the families so that the, we as the PTA could reach out to them, right? Right. Okay. So yeah, for us, it's a huge issue. Um, We've tried to start our own mailing list by just asking families through signage and Facebook, which we really don't have a lot of followers either. Um, <clears throat> but we don't have a parent coordinator right now. So we really are struggling to contact families right now. I'm just using printed flyers. That's the only means of communication we have um, because I was told um, that we're not allowed to have you know the school's master list so i'm happy that you brought this up because that you know means to me that that it, the information i was given was in fact correct and i guess we're not the only ones that are kind of struggling with this so i think it would be a huge benefit to if uh, i'm sure other people have the same issue so i mean this is like great news to me sounds like <laughs> well it's a it's a movement it's not yet there there are some maybe issues and i don't know if if anyone here from FACE can um, allude to, to any information on that. I know that there's some privacy laws in place that the school cannot share that, but usually PTAs try very hard to put that in their like um, introduction letter in the year and try to get that information. But then what happens is we don't get everyone's information and then parents get left out. And it's not done on purpose. It's just that we don't have this information and not everyone can benefit from it. So I'm glad that to get that feedback, Janet, no, we are not, you're not the only ones, uh, all PTAs struggle with this and we're trying to yeah. fill in the gap. And I guess this is where the movement comes in and they wanted uh, our district to sign a petition on it. So that's why I'm bringing it here to you guys to see if you want to be part of that 
petition to to sign it so that we can say that district 25 would like to see this happening in the future so uh thank you yeah i would be i would definitely sign that <laughs> thank you Oh, sorry, Christine. Oh, no, no, no. I think that would be great because, yeah, as a parent coming into a school, if you're coming into a new school and you're giving the school your information and then you have to sign up for this and then you have to sign up for that. I think if we could, if we could find some way to have the parents sign up once and get all of this information from all different outlooks of the school, PTA included. So I think that's a very good idea. And, and maybe it could be like one sheeter that says if you want to opt out, at least we have permission that they, you know, reason why they didn't receive something was because they didn't want to be part of the PTA mailing list. I mean, because we also yeah. want to think of the parents too that say, hey, I don't want everyone to have my information, you know, but they want to know what's happening yeah. in school. Deborah? Yes, yeah, so something that we've been doing at 209 this year, we started it with fifth grade and it's actually helped a little bit. Um, we go through the right channels. We have our parent coordinators send everything out. We do the flyers in the red folders that go home, hard copies. But then we ask the teachers to also share our information through their Google Classroom and their class dojos. And we've been doing that with fifth grade. And because of that, we have 100% contact information for our fifth grade class this year. Um, but that was only because we had the teachers send it in addition. Sometimes parents, you know, see the emails from parent coordinators, they may scroll past them, but they get a message from their teacher, they're going to open it. So that's been our experience this year. Well, thank you, Deborah. That was definitely helpful for those of you who, just for Janet, at least, if to get information, since they have no parent coordinator, that may be a route you might want to take. Um, yeah, I'm going to try that. Thank you. For now. Um, anyone else would like to share? So I guess at, at this time, I just want um, a show of support of us uh, going along with this, um, I guess, movement and to see if, if it can be done in the, in, the, in the future for our PTAs. So I guess um, a show of hands or thumbs up or um, if you don't know how to do the reaction, just so that I can know, okay. I see a lot of support. I myself, I will, if you guys are, are I will support as well. Anything to help our PTAs um, work smoother. Anyone oppose? Anyone have any objections of why we shouldn't get this information or so? KU, are you a thumbs up for yes or thumbs up for no? for yes thank you okay so at this time i'll 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 let that um voting member that reached out to me know that we will be part of it i will ask for a draft um so maybe we could the, ne the next meeting i don't know how fast it's going to be but i will say that our district does support the movement of getting parents information in the beginning of the year so that we can conduct pta business okay thank you um, um let me see I see some of our speakers tonight. Um, before that, we have our minutes. Christine, do you want to share the minutes or do you want to table the minutes for? Um, I can share them. Okay. Uh, I have a whole bunch of tabs open, so let me apologize in advance. I'm going to have to unbury it after I share my, my. Are you taking minutes tonight? Yes, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, all right. They go by different. I think this is it. Let me let me know. Is that the one, or is it the yes. one that I need to complete? Okay.
You guys let me know if I'm going too fast. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Deborah, thank you. Can I get a second? You can unmute yourself, thumbs up it or Can someone second the motion, please? Is this for all of us or just for the board members? For all of you. For everybody. I don't think I'm allowed to approve my own minutes, right? <laughs> I second it. Thank you, Tiffany. You're welcome. And then awesome. all in favor, thumbs up. And anyone opposed? Anyone? No, okay, so the minutes have been approved. Thank you, Christine. And so our treasurer's report, um, we haven't had any activity. And I think this year the board decided we're not gonna collect dues, right, Christine, am I correct? Yes, because you're correct. It's, it's, we're not really- We're not person. doing anything. We weren't planning to, on, um, Getting getting together. I mean, unless at the end of the year, I believe we discussed, but we still do have money in the account from last year, from the previous years. So yeah. So once we go in person, it's a little bit easier because we, most of the money was used to for hosting and for copies and stuff like that. But being that we're virtual, it doesn't really. And it's it's and we're not in the buildings as well to deposit monies and so forth. So. Because it'd be too complicated, we decided this year we're not going to collect dues, but that will change um, on a yearly basis depending on uh, how we are in this pandemic. Okay, so that um, the treasury report has not changed. So whatever financials we've had in the past is still there. Okay, so at this time, we're going to, um, if we have any speakers, I do see here, hold on, let me see. It. Um, for Parent Square, I see. Lynn. Um, you do have the your guest from Parent Square here. Um, yeah, yeah, Lynn. I just yes, said Lynn. yes, <laughs> Lynn and Hunter. Yeah, Hunter actually is not here today, okay. but uh, he had a, he had an appointment that he's attending. But Amanda, one of our VPs, is here as well. She's just going to be a fly on the wall, but uh, just always nice to have another person to connect with. <laughs> but yeah, Hunter, I know many of you already know from from previous conversations. Okay, great. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you for being here. For those of you, if you want in the gallery, you can put them as speaker so that you could just see them, the person who's speaking, or you can keep it as gallery, your choice. So um, welcome, Lynn, and take it Thank away. Thank you. All right. Well, this is exciting. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Does it say? Yes, yes, yes. I'm able to see. Yeah, we're able to see it. Okay, wait, which screen are you seeing now? Are you seeing? The one that says Parent Square Unified All School Communication, Communication Fantastic. School District 25. <laughs> we're, we're on the right screen. I love that. Well, thank you. Good evening. I, I think like, like it was shared before, many of you probably already heard about us. And uh, about I, we looked up the statistics, actually had, had Hunter pull some data before, and it looks like a good 15 to 20% of the schools within your district alone already use this parent square. And I saw some had added, you know, what school they're coming in from. So I know we have some active parent square users with us, which is wonderful. Uh, so again, appreciate your time. Uh, it's interesting, you were talking about 
the challenge you've been having um, as a PTA organization uh, to communicate and collaborate with uh, your parents. And I think that goes across for many departments uh, within a school district, not just the PTA, the teachers. You know, what do we do? How do we reach our parents in an effective way? So that's kind of what Parent Square is all about. And we're going to go into the details here. I'll have this done in a quick 10 minutes. I know you have a lot on your agenda, so I'll get started. Um, my name is Lynn Sillers. So I'm a co-founder at Parent Score. So I've been doing this from the early days. Um, and I have three kids myself. So I've been an end user of Parent Score. Luckily, for the entire time they've been in school. Um, my, when my now 13-year-old was in, in uh, elementary school, uh, my school was one of the test schools. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of the timeline that Parent Score has been around as well. And then Hunter, who couldn't join us today, I just want to put his contact info here. Him and me, you know, we'll be your resources going forward. We worked a lot with the PS schools and uh, contact either one of us for more information. And also if you want to set up kind of a more of an in-depth demo for your school site um, uh, in itself, you know, maybe after the winter break uh, as time goes on. So. Esther, by the way, I just want to give you a quick shout out and thank you for arranging this and then getting us on the agenda. I really appreciate that. So thank you. All right. Um, I was going to start. I always like um, to start a little bit with the, <laughs> with the parent score story. And Esther, if you have anything to add up front, you know, I love hearing about that. Well, um, you guys, Hunter reached out to me and I reached out to the board and they went ahead and put you on the agenda. So uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, we're, we're super excited. So, so a little bit of the background since I have been from the early days and uh, our founder, Anu Vaid, this is her picture. And um, she's a good friend of mine as well. Uh, she's a brilliant software engineer. She has kids. Uh, when they started school, she was a little flustered about the communication that she was getting from the school and she became curious when she found herself navigate you know one system to the next and she said you know that was when her engineering brain kicked in and said there's got to be a different way so she actually took a bit of a sabbatical and started coding and it started you know tested it at her kids school site and she actually started with the pta which is always interesting she got the pta involved she got the principal involved and she got the teachers involved and all of them started using one and the same tool for a lot of different um, types of communication. And she said, I want to take you from the spaghetti communication into one and the same platform. And I think this is a pretty good representation of what she was experiencing and what today many of our schools and districts are still experiencing. There's a lot of tools out there and communication is really involved evolved from the one-way push notification, emergency alerts, which we know all districts and school need to have in place to all these different apps and classroom communication tools. And then we have the social media. And again, I heard a lot of that frustration coming from the room already and everyone is looking to make improvements. So we have the app puzzle. And as I just show you a lot of these, I think some of these names will sound very familiar. And these tools are very good, but in isolation, they're not the greatest for communication as far as like collaborative communication and parent engagement, and also giving that insight and access from an administrative perspective. So think about the tools that you have today, and then imagine if, you know, a lot of these tools will still be in place as far as the the benefits you see in them, but it's all done in one and the same platform. So this next slide, we'll go back to that puzzle. We're going to take you from that spaghetti chart into one and the same platform and make sure that administrators can use this tool for emergency alerts and notices and newsletters and other great announcements that are needed. We'll have all teachers that can use one and the same tool for all classroom communication. And we work with TK through 12. And uh, we found a really good way to we'll get to how we get data into our system. We've actually developed quite a good partnership uh, via a clever integration. We'll go into more details about that later. And also, you know, after winter break, when you <laughs> deep, deep dive of that. But the beauty is that 
what you will see is this is a tool that your PTA will utilize. So for any type of events that you're putting together, any signups, any wish lists you have, any forms that you need signed, in addition to just awareness. Teacher wanna you know, create awareness so parents can support their children. And we know that effect of you know, involved and engaged parents lead to student success. And that's always been the end goal of parents where how can we improve and help the students? And by doing so, it really involved the parents so they feel like they're part of the school and they can you know, feel supported by the school and also support um, their, their child and children. So whether you like technology or not, we give parents a lot of options. Parents can get text messages. They can get app notification in case they download our free app. There's no requirement to have the app downloaded. They can also get emails and then we have that emergency alert component built in. So this next slide is just a really good representation of all the things that Parent Square provides. So our smart alerts, which would be that one-way push notification for school closures, snow days, sports cancellation, if your coaches are utilizing this, uh, PTA, you know, giving quick updates about, you know, a quick reminder about an upcoming event that they want everyone to go to. Um, and this is more that traditional one-way push, can go out as a phone call, either your own recorded voice or a robocall. Uh, it can go out as a text message. For any parent that downloads the app, they'll naturally get the app notification. And then there's the email component that can be included. One beautiful thing about our smart alert is how long they can be, up to 300 characters as far as the texting goes. And uh, I also always wanna emphasize that all we do in parents will we translate it into the home language of the parents. Now, classroom communication, we know that teachers use a multitude of tools, especially when you're working in TK through 12. So I have two elementary school boys and one in middle school, and it's a whole different ballgame what they do in elementary versus middle school. But again, if you have a tool like parents where the consistency remains for me as a parent, so whether it's... Um, me hearing from the third grade teachers or the eighth grade teachers, I get the communication the way I prefer, which is usually via the, an app notification. Uh, but there's also other ways, of course, text and the email. And classroom communication also opens up that two-way dialogue in a safe environment. Uh, parents can actually respond back, they can RCP to events, they can raise their hand, and then we have a ton of school services. So I'm going to show you, and don't get overwhelmed, Parent Square is truly a one-stop shop for all school tone communication. So sometimes when I show this slide, people go, whoa, we, we have a lot of tools for this already, and I get that, and that's kind of the whole point. Think about the tools that does this today, and how can we put that in one platform to give that single point experience for the parent, whether it's filling out a permissions, field trip permission slip, or RSVPing to a quick event, or maybe paying for the yearbook or for apparel, or you know, you're doing some kind of a annual giving fundraiser, that can be done in Parent Square. We also have a health screening form that we've seen, you know, the highs and lows of, you know, it's peaking, people are using it, then people stop using it. We're gonna keep it there for as long as it's gonna be needed. So again, it's truly a, a one platform where you get all these features. You may not need to use them all from the get-go, from the beginning, but know that they're gonna be available for you. And um, the classroom communication, teachers love using Parent Square. You will love using Parent Square. Um, you can do classroom, grade level, group messaging. We also have private messaging. And again, I wanna emphasize, because I know there's a lot of different languages utilized within um, your district. And even private messaging can be initiated by a parent or a student, but parent in particular in this cadence, uh, for in their home language, and they can reach out to a teacher, the teacher would receive that information in English, can write back in English, and again, it's translated back into whatever home language uh, the parent have. And parents can choose their settings, they can choose their home language, they can choose the time that they want to receive information. What they cannot choose is when they get the emergency alerts, that they're always going to get in real time in a multitude of, of methods, uh, however it can be delivered. Um, so. What we have, and I know we're, we're gonna move quickly here. Parent Square is a portal. It's all hosted in the Amazon cloud. 
Uh, it's uh, we're a great partner with AWS. Have been now, you know, since the early days. And Parent Square is very much set up to look and feel like a social media platform. It's intuitive. It's easy on the eye. You can do photo, file, video sharing. And we open up that two-way communication. And we also measure all the different metrics that comes to not just communication, reach, and deliverability, but also when it comes to engagement. How are parents engaging back with the school? So with everyone using the same tool, we can give you those statistics and we can also start to give you an historical view of the improvements that you're making as a school. So I know your, some of your struggles have been reach and deliverability. So we have a way to show you because now we can actually get classes from ATS into STARS and set that up and align it just so. And you can see exactly what students have missing parent contact information. Teachers can see it, admins can see it. And we have different ways. You can either allow parents to add and change contact information right into Parent Square, or it can be done in ATS. And then we have a syncing component set up to where it updates into Parent Square. So we've seen great successes here with the over 40 schools, PS schools that we already work with. And we wanna continue that for you or anyone that needs it um, moving forward. And um, here's just a quick slide of a direct message too. So just so you know, beyond the, classroom and grade level and school-wide and when we work with districts the district-wide announcements and uh, even the private messaging the one-to-one -one, have that direct translation as i mentioned before and there's over a hundred different languages that we support and um, so beyond the portal i mentioned we have an app the app is not just an app for parents and students to download the app is really great for any staff member to download and utilize. It gives you the flexibility to respond to messages or initiate a message, or if you take pictures with your phone, by all means, share them via the app. It makes it really easy. You can also send out your emergency alerts and notices via the app. So the mobile platform and the portal is very much a reflection of each other. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna stay here long but via Clever, we found a really clever way <laughs> to work with the PS schools. It hasn't always come easy to us. So I always like to emphasize that we've had some challenges, but right now we have a wonderful partnership and we have come up with a data sharing process that has been approved by the NYC DOE. So I want you all to be aware of that. And we will share this with anyone that wants to know uh, kind of the steps that we take uh, to get schools going and to get contact data into the system so you can become complete when it comes to your outreach. And um, I want to take questions. I'm going to say, you know, happy holidays. It's right around the corner. So we're so grateful that we got these 10 minutes. And I think I left another minute or two maybe for questions. And if anyone has anything to add that's already a parents were user would love to hear that as well. Does anyone have any questions at this point from the presentation? Lynn, can you stop sharing so I could just get a, there, there you go, thank you. Okay, I don't see any hands up, anyone? Now I do have a question for Margaret uh, Liang. You said that you use Parent Square. If you wanna, if you can please unmute yourself and just share that with us. Yeah, I'm the parent coordinator of PS32. We do use Parent Square. We've used it for, um, I think this is our second year. I believe my PTA president is still on. She also uses it to reach out to families for like sales and stuff. And it really is a great tool because it does translate, which is very important for our school. Um, we do a lot of signups on there, like parent teacher conference signups. When I need volunteers, I use it for sign up. We use it for messaging parents directly. We could do group messaging, private messaging, everything she was saying. And, and I have to tell you, it is a fantastic tool. And uh, I'd be willing to, you know, talk to anybody that has any questions about it. You could feel free to um, ask Esther for my contact info and you can reach out to me and we will answer any questions. And again, my PTA president also uses it 
to outreach to our families, we give her access and she can send posts and messages to every family in the school and say, here's an apparel sale, here's this, or she could do it by grade. So we highly recommend it. So I have a question uh, for Margaret and or, or Lynn. Um, so the school puts in the information in Parent Square. Is that how it works? And then the parents, the, the PTAs then have this to use for their fundraisers or any events happening? It, Lynn, it actually syncs up with Clever. Is that correct? That is correct. So we have an, a very much an automated process already established for PS School. So many schools prior has kind of paved the path and figured out all the kinks. So now we have a wonderful system. So you will work with our onboarding team who creates your site and load your data for you. And then we can set up, like I said, there's a, some schools choose to do what we call um, um, self-managed school where they can make changes themselves. Many other schools like that nightly sync. Others, you know, when they see a lot of changes, drop us a new set of CSV files and we upload it for you. But overall, we made it very smooth and easy and given the PA schools a lot of flexibility because we know of the challenges that you've had in the past and still have to this day about getting and reaching all your school community. Thank you so much, Lynn. Yeah, of course. Being here. Um, any questions before we move on? And Margaret or Lynn, if you want to put your email address in the chat. Um, yes, I'll add that right now. And um, and then I'm going to drop off because I know you have a big agenda to cover. Here's me. And I'm also going to add, because many of you already know and have been in contact with Hunter, who is my right hand man. They call us Batman and Robin. <laughs> So if you want to, you know, get a hold of Hunter and set up some time to talk to me and see a demo and get a little bit more info, maybe in the new year, please do so. We, we'd love to chat with you and continue the, you know, helping you with communication and parent engagement. So thanks again. Thank you. I Thank see you. It's, still, it, it's still daylight where you are. <laughs> you know what? We're in California. California. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you, Margaret, for putting your information. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, appreciate it. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy Take great holidays. care. Bye. Bye for now. Okay, hold on. Um, let me see. So tonight I know that our beacon will not be speaking tonight. Um, they just let us know. I know that Shirley is coming later on, but we do have here one of my special guests, because she's from my school, is Deborah Ferrara. She's our PTA um, president in our school. And um, we did a silent auction. I remember when we were talking, we were trying to figure out, remember Deborah, we were trying to figure out how we were gonna sell this and how we, so uh, the principal I think came up with a, si a silent auction. And I remember us talking and saying, how, how are we gonna get people? And I said, well, doesn't Amazon have like wish lists? Like maybe they can put, and you know, and Deborah just made it happen. So I'm going to pass the floor to Deborah, and then you can talk to us about it. Thank, thank you, Francis. Yes, Francis is all hands on deck in my PTA. We start right from the top with the principal. We go, I go and cry in her office, and she helps me come up with ideas. And then I throw the ideas to the board, and they create these amazing, um, amazing things. So I'm going to share my screen. I should be able to. Right. Yes. Here we go. So what we did last year was, um, like Francis said, the online silent auction. That's because we were in the middle of all the craziness with we had uh, blended learners. We had remote learners. So we wanted to make sure that we could include I the audio. Hmm? I this I Are we OK? It's breaking up a lot. Okay, let me move rooms. That might help. Sometimes my internet connection is no good in there. So you'll have to excuse my messy kitchen, but this is where you'll be able to hear me. All right, so um, back to my square. My um, Let me just pull up my thing. 
All right, so we did it through 32 auctions. And like Francis said, the first thing that we did was we had to collect all of the donations. So we created, as a board, we picked like 10 or 15 themes. And then we created individual basket ideas. So like, for example, we can go, let me open one up. So for the visual learners out there like myself. Okay, so one of the baskets, for example, was an arts and crafts basket. And we took, we went on Amazon and we just started checking off items that would fit into this themed basket. And then we did a COVID basket, which was all um, uh, hand sanitizer, paper towels. We had an electronics basket, which FYI, I bid on and won because there was earbuds in there that I really wanted and I have those now. Um, so that's what we did. We had this Amazon wish list, and then we sent that out to the families. And the address on the Amazon wish list was my home address. So everything came directly to my house because we were not really allowed in the building. And if we were, it was one person at a time. So we used my home as um, base. And we created the baskets, and then I'll open one up to show you. And then what we were, this is the back end. What we were able to do was upload pictures, a little description, and then we opened bidding. And parents were able to, so we started the bidding, whatever it was at this one, I forget what we started it at. Um, and then it was increments of, I believe $5. Yes, $5. So, in, and it was fun. The parents would joke around. They would, you know, we would see them chatting about it on our Facebook page. The few parents we saw at school, everyone got a kick out of it. There was a big bidding war at the end. I wanna show this because it was so much fun. The iPad, so we had, oh, we had gift card towers. Um, some of our family, one of the things we put on the wish list was Amazon gift cards and other gift cards. And we were able to make these two giant gift card towers, which was awesome. But we had, so the iPad, we had a family member donate the iPad to us. And then we were able to see there was 26 people. This is how the bidding went. We, at the back end, we were able to watch it. And the bidding ended at midnight um, on the, whatever date we ended it on, February 4th, I apologize. And so that's basically how this works. We wound up making, I want to say close to 2000, but I'm going to look at the home page. It was so easy to set up. Where is it? Yeah, $1,758.56. And it was all free money. It cost nothing for us to, the, all the items were donated to us. The website was free. They did take a percentage at the end. It was 2%. Um, but it wound up to be not much of anything. Parents were able to pay either via credit card directly on the 32 auctions website, or they were able to pay us um, at that time with PayPal. Uh, we did have a few that we collected checks from. Um, so this, this, um, but the bidding, that's the accurate amount. And all in all, it took us about two weeks of collecting items and then one day of assembling the baskets. And then the rest was done online from the comfort of home. Um, does anyone have any questions? It was really simple. This year, it's been a little bit easier to, to do some of our traditional in-person fundraisers, like our pie sales and our spirit wear apparel sales. But this is um, a great backup for a quick, easy online fundraiser. It's super safe. And as you can see, we raised a nice chunk of change. Um, does anyone have any questions? No questions. That's okay. I'm always around, and Frances knows how to find me whenever she wants. Yeah, um, if anyone's interested in setting it up, I'll set it up with you. I'll walk you through it. I have so much fun doing this stuff. Janet, do you have a question? Yes. Well, first, I just wanted to say that that's an awesome idea, um, and it looks like pretty easy. And I was going to ask about the percentage of the website, 2%, not bad at all. Um, but I wanted to ask how how did you promote it to your families and how often did you so about it? Like, did you do like constant reminders or? We did, and that's one thing I didn't mention. So we sent out an initial flyer, um, like an informational flyer, and then we included asking for the donations with the link to the Amazon wish list. And then we have an amazing parent coordinator who's just, she's on the ball and she's so awesome. Um, every time we, she would send out weekly reminders for us um, from the beginning to the end, it was about four weeks. So she did at least three or four reminders for us, but also the site generated automatic um, emails too. So once you bid on something, you got an email. If someone bid against you, you got an email. And then there was reminders letting you know, you know, how much longer the um, auction would be open for it email people the night before, email people the hour before the auction was about to end. So 
you were constantly getting emails. Um, there was no way to escape this auction. <laughs> And I just want to add, Janet, that we created a wish list on Amazon. Everything was purchased on Amazon. Um, it was right from your own home. You just donated that way. Usually when we're in person, they, we the, the children can bring it from the home um, items. And each, each class gets like a theme. So they might have movie, a movie night. So all the kids bring either popcorn or something having to do with movies but i believe this time we, we had a, a wish list for each basket and then people donated whatever they could and we also asked our community as well like the ipad we get from a family member every year we got um gift certificates for haircuts to some of the barber shops um some of the restaurants gave us um gift cards as well so definitely reach out to your communities when you're looking for stuff Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Coming tonight and speaking about the auction. And we appreciate that. And for anyone who has, you know, um, any questions, just let us know. And if you don't, you know, spread the word about the silent auctions and Parent Square, the, the speakers that you, that have spoken tonight. Okay. Um, at this time, I don't see... The superintendent might still be on her way and Shirley as well for the A660 changes. For those of you who don't know the A660, that's like the chancellor's bylaws, the regulation. So anything in there um, needs to be in our bylaws in the sense of we can't add anything that will ever contradict the bylaws of the chancellors. So I'll give you an example, like term limits, right? There are, they, they, the chancellor says you could have term limits if you want. It doesn't specify any um, certain amount, but at least it allows you to have term limits. So then it's up to your PTA to make up term limits. Um, and the term limits a lot of people use is to kind of encourage parent involvement, right? Because we don't want the same person there all the oh, time. And that I yeah, so you do have a term limit, which is basically from the beginning of the school year to the end. That's one term limit. You're saying about how many times a person could be, right? right? How many times a person can run for the same. So yes, yeah. also, you're correct. So all the, everyone who gets on a board, it, it's a one year deal, right? Because it's the school year is one year. But after that, if they say that person wants to run again in the same role, they can, if there are, if there are any term limits, right? They may not be like, say, for example, if it's a two year term, meaning that, OK, I was president one year. I want to do president again. But after the second term, usually in your bylaws, it would state that you could only run um, after your term limit if no one else runs, um, which would mean that if if I say I don't see anyone running and then, OK, I want to run a third year, I would say, OK, since no one's running, I'll run again. But. I can't say I'm going to run again because then it eliminates someone else from running. But, you know, it's up to your school to decide, you know, let someone else run. So if let's say if I decide, well, I'm going to run a third year. And then let's say um, Christine says, I'm going, I want to run this year. I have to step down because I'm not really supposed to um, run a third term. So this is there. It's put some, some of you may not have term limits. Some of you may have, but one thing that we cannot put is like requirements. The only requirement that the chancellor's regulations say is that you're a parent of, of a child in the school. That is the only, there's no experience on a PTA, not one year experience before you can run for president. I mean, although we would love parents to be involved, to be experienced, to be organized, you know, but those are not requirements to be part of the PTA. All I parents, think the superintendent's um, on. Oh, she is? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so all parents are part of the PTA. All teachers, if you have a PTA, are part of the PTA. And it's funny when I tell parents, are you coming to the PTA meeting? And they go, oh, that's only for people on the PTA. And I go, well, you are part of the PTA. And then they go, I am. And so you definitely have to have those conversations that everyone is part of the PTA. Um, and although in, in the beginning of the year, we asked to pay a donation, whether they pay or not, they're still part of the PTA. So um, welcome. Uh, 
Danielle, I, I, I just saw her. Did she leave again? I Did see. She... Hold on. She was here. There, she came back. Gone. She came back. Oh, here she's coming back. Um, so yeah, we're just waiting see... for the superintendent, Danielle Domango, to come on, and then she's going to give her report. Wait, do you see her? Because I don't see her now. I see a box. I'm assuming it's her, but I don't see any okay, name. Let's give her a minute. Let's give her a minute. She's still saying. So anyway, someone's going to come later to talk about the A660 changes because there was a lot of being that the virtual world was a new world for us. Right. And the like, parents weren't allowed to vote um, virtually. And now they can through an access code and stuff like that. Um, changes had to be made to the chancellor's regulations to kind of give us guidance of what we can do virtually. So Shirley Auburn is going to be here later on to talk to us about that. Um, right now she's running a PT, her PTA elections in her school, or maybe she's helping out another school. So she will be here later on. So we're just waiting for Danielle. Danielle. I see her name on there, but it, she's, I think she's no having movement. a yeah. signing on. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm trying to see, because it's, you know, usually it says connecting to audio or, you yes. know, and, and something yeah, was, I couldn't see it. So she just, just left. She's probably right back. So oh, I, I just, say hello to Michelle. Michelle, Michelle's on our board. Sorry, Michelle. We just, we just, I, I saw you come in, but um, Lynn was speaking. So I, so I just wanted to add. So there is a lot of changes to A660. FACE went ahead and had some trainings on the 14, 15, and 16. If you were able to attend, it was very useful and very informative. They talked about a lot of changes. I know that uh, somebody's going to come later on and go into detail, but we we will continue to discuss this because this is new information, and you're probably going to have more questions. And you're welcome to see the recordings from Face. They're up on Parent. Uh, oh my God, I just went blank on the Parent. Um, I'll put it in the chat, and so you guys could go and look at that recording, and. Um, get the full information. She's back on now. Let's see if she is able to speak. Danielle? There we go. She's connecting to audio. I can see it now. Mm -hmm. Yay. You're muted. Oh, there, there you she go. I said, I'm sorry. I just tried to get in 800 times. Did you? <laughs> and we saw you 800 times. <laughs> Is everything okay? You're wearing a mask at home. <laughs> yes, everything. You know what? I just forget to take it off. You know what? I just prefer it. It holds up my chin fat. That's one of the things that I like. That's good. She's there. being a good role model. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Continue. Did I interrupt? No, we're waiting for you. You're up. Oh, no. yeah. Perfect, perfect timing. It was perfect Is timing. Is it really perfect timing? Yeah, it really was. Oh, oh. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Before I get off this call and do my presentation, I just really want to take an opportunity to wish all of you a happy and healthy holiday. And when I say healthy, I really mean healthy. I know it has been crazy. Um, and I am hoping that 2022 brings us a better year. Um, you know, I do want you to know that, um, and I do understand it's, it's very frustrating. I hope that your principles are communicating with you. Um, and I know that Francis and the board have gone over, like there's a lot of HIPAA and FERPA laws that prevent parents from, from getting details of information, but um, parents are, uh, principals are working t really literally 24 seven, calling the situation room, making sure things are reported. I have to tell you, you know, and look, I, I really do need to give credit where credit is due. There has not been one case that a principal hasn't reported, right? And I don't know if that's happening in other districts because I don't really ask, but we that is not the concern. If anything, our principals are getting in trouble for over-reporting. <laughs> so, because they really do want the kids to be safe. Um, so I do know it is a frustrating time, but you know, as you guys all know, um, we're, we are doing a lot of closures right now. Um, so I didn't know if anyone had any questions regarding um, COVID, because I know that a lot of schools are, are having closures. So I'll take an opportunity to answer questions that people may have right now. Oh. 
Okay. Um, no PS209, Francis, am I still gonna be able to get my pies? You guys sitting up outside, how's that working? Because me and Louis need to pick up. Deborah, yes. you're here, make sure my pies are ready. We have contingency plans on our contingency <laughs> plans. On our contingency plans. <laughs> Make sure we're in the loop and Deborah's house. You is coming to my house to pick them up. <laughs> Deborah's house is the contingency plan. <laughs> Great fundraiser! If you want the superintendent to participate in your fundraiser, um, do something with pies and send me the the menu, <laughs> just so everyone knows. Thank you so much. Pies. We do appreciate it. <laughs> I will buy pies. Um, so I wanted to go over, um, and thank our parent leaders and that includes Francis. And I don't know, is Shirley on tonight? Did I miss her? No, she's coming soon. She's holding an election. Okay, great. Um, so Francis and Shirley as our parent leaders, and I do encourage you guys to, um, if you feel comfortable, really take on the role of being a parent leader, as you know, and I say this all the time, um, I try my best to make parents feel comfortable, but parents feel comfortable the most around parents. So whenever we have um, large events, I, I am really thankful for um, people like Francis and, and members of the CEC, Shirley from the DLT. Um, and, I, and I do see that many of you make presentations on the work that you're doing and sharing with each other. I do encourage you to do that. So I know that many of you have heard of Brilliant New York City. Um, and we did on November 29th, was it 29th? Louis, correct me if I'm wrong, let me just check my calendar. Um, host a um, district-wide event on um, what brilliant New York City can look like across our district. And I wanted to be able to share it with you. Um, one of the things that I was really proud of in terms of brilliant New York City is um, when they were telling me about the expectations of the what the work can and should look like it is so similar to what we all believe in in district 25 right our parents expectations for our schools our principals expectation for our teachers our teachers expectation for our students and you know what our students expectations for their teachers right i've been doing school visits i don't know if i've spoken to any of your children but i know that they have a lot to say um I've really been very interested in a lot of the student chats. Um, and, you know, just this past Friday, I had a student chat with students who were talking about how they feel when they raise their hands and their teachers don't call on them. Um, it was it was really eye opening. And I did it in the presence of the principal um, and a few teachers. And it was just so nice for them to see that perspective of, um, I raise my hand and you don't call on me. And then you tell my parents that I don't participate. You know, like I just loved that honesty. And then I don't like being in your class. <laughs> it was just, it was so, honestly, it was great. And, and so I've really been encouraging that, you know, it, it is a student voice that I never had when I was younger. Um, so we're gonna continue um, to build upon that. So you heard me last year and the year before talking about parent chats. Those have been really great. Thank you. Um, if you've been on any of them, I did participate in a parent chat um, with parent leaders around math, girls, math perception in middle school math. Um, and it was with girls who were struggling in math and their moms. And we spent some time talking about how I even do this with my daughter. When she sometimes struggles, I'm like, oh, I'm not good at math. You're going to have to talk to somebody else about that. And how when she was younger, that's actually the perception that I gave her and how it's really important that we change that, right? Like we sit down and figure it out together. So, so I'm really proud of, of the work that we're doing and how it's elevating parent leadership and student leadership. And Brilliant New York City was really part of that. So as you know, we're getting a new mayor and new chancellor on January 1st. So we can't speak about anything in absolutes. All we know is that we absolutely have a lot of COVID right now. That we do know, but we don't know um, what the expectations of our new mayor and chancellor will look like. So, so brilliant New York City, and I will just say, was an opportunity for us to say, um, it's really important that we see our students, all of them, and we see their talents, and we celebrate that work. And that's why, um, you know, parent leaders like Francis and Shirley and Joseph Di Benedetto were so willing to be part of it, not because they were taking a side of, oh, we're getting rid of 
of gifted and talented. As you know, our, our new mayor and chancellor are not saying that, right? So that's, that may or may not be the case. I'm leaning more towards may not, I'm not sure. Um, but for me, I really took on that work as a challenge to tell our community and show our community all of the things that we've really done. So we talked about our work with Bank Street and early childhood math and how we're starting at a very young age to develop math schools of our student, uh, math skills of our students and to develop the math skills and the math teaching skills of our teachers for early childhood math. We talked about our connection with algebra for all and how across district 25, any child that wants to take the regents exam in eighth grade has the ability to do that across all of our middle schools. Because what we do know is when students do that, um, they, and it doesn't necessarily have to be every single regents that is offered, but when students have the ability to take um, accelerated coursework in eighth grade, then they are, um, they have an opportunity to take more accelerated course, it, courses in high school, right? So I'm gonna say something that I shouldn't say, right? Because I say this to my daughter. My daughter's taking physics right now because she had an opportunity to take regents in eighth grade. That was unheard of for me. Like I would never have taken on that challenge, but you know what, she had that choice. And she was like, hey, I wanna try this. And I was like, okay, she was really good in science. And now she's taking physics and she's doing really well. Um, and when that happened, um, I kind of said, hey, you know, let's do that in District 25 because I wanna do everything that's awesome and cool for kids, right? So if it works out for my kids, it should work out for everyone's kids. So I was like, everyone can take the regions. So over um, the past three years, we've doubled the amount of students who have taken the regions uh, classes in District 25. So I'm really proud of that. You know, you guys should be too. And I will say, starting from younger grades, you should start talking to your kids because those decisions sometimes are made in sixth grade. Right, kids go into to school in sixth grade. My expectation for schools now is if your children are not ready for regents, um, what are we gonna do to get them ready if they wanna be ready, right? So, so those are the conversations that we're having. And to me, that's what Brilliant New York City is really about. It's about offering opportunities for our students so they can maximize their talents. That doesn't mean we're getting rid of gifted and talented. It did mean that under Mayor de Blasio, right? I'm gonna be honest. It might not mean that right now. So, so what I will say is we've spent a lot of time and that time really talking about the things we do well. Our civics for all work, right? Where our students are making statements around things that are happening in the world around them and challenging that. Our um, computer science for all work where our students are coding and doing architecture work starting as early as kindergarten. So, so we did spend time really showing that to and showcasing that. And one of the things that I've learned is that our parents really appreciated that. So we need to do that more. So I am reaching out to you guys to start the new years to let's make sure that we capture the things that are good in our schools. Um, you know, very much like me, I don't think our principals really showcase all that that we see that's really good. So. Um, we can spend some time at President's Council really celebrating that. Francis does that a lot with me. You know, she talks about what she sees that's good out there. Um, so I encourage you guys to continue to do that and to have some time for us to share that as a community at President's Council. So Francis, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about Brilliant New York City and, and how, um, I know you, your, um, your group uh, did not show up, <laughs> but, but you did have an opportunity to be in some of the small group settings and, and maybe you could talk about a little bit of, of what you heard. I think a lot of people were just, um, I guess, thinking that um, what happens to the kids that are already in Gifted and Talented, and from my understanding, they still stay in those programs, mm -hmm. and they continue on with that type of learning. So those kids that are already in those program programs will not be affected at all. I think overall, um, it's a way of encompassing everyone to be taught the way, you know, uh, that's why it's called Brilliance New York City. It's, it's for, for the whole curriculum to change and to make all of our children brilliant, right? And to, to capture their strengths in and, 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 and different aspects because all of our children have different strengths. Um, every, every child has a strength, right? And so we want to capture that all. And that was from my understanding of what was Brilliant New York City. And I think maybe people will... Let's, let's roll it out and let's see how it, it, it starts. You know, that's the only way we're gonna know, right? And once we roll it out to see how it's affecting all our children. But yep. I do and agree, what, it, it's like in our school, a lot of parents would say, well, my, my child's in gifted and talented, but we had so many gifted and talented teachers that 
taught that as a regular curriculum. So all our kids were benefiting from that type of teaching. So I think that's like the same with Brilliant in New York City. Yep, and, and really part of that training for Brilliant New York City is training kindergarten teachers to look at student strengths. Like to, to say like, here's some of the things that I see Danielle doing really well, right? Instead of only looking at, well, you know, Danielle can do this a little bit better. It's really, let me tell you what Danielle does really well and how I create opportunities in my classroom to allow Danielle to, to get even better or to learn through what she does really well. And then for schools to start talking about, including principals, as students, students accelerate, for them to have opportunities to engage in things that they do really well, right? So, um, so to be continued on Brilliant New York City, but what I wanna say is there was, some, there was some negativity about it, but what it was is a co-creation together with communities and parents about what we wanna see in our schools for our students. And that I really liked, you know, and we could, we've always done that in District 25. So to be continued. Yeah, and I think also, I think one of the points why this was changed is because all this assessment was done on one test. And, you know, parents felt it wasn't a fair assessment for a child when other students may not be good test takers, but they might be, you know, brilliant in other areas. So I think this will definitely give every student a chance to get an opportunity to, to really get their, their strengths um, seen. So we'll try it out. Yep. So, and not only that, but I also think there are parents that did not know about the gifted and talented test, right? So, you know, I say all the things that my son missed out of because I was like new to my town and I had no idea. Like he didn't play any sports. He didn't do anything because I didn't know. You know, and I probably would have missed the gift and talented test if I moved into District 25 because I didn't know, you know. So I think it's really about that, too, to say, um, let, let's really look at, at all of our kids to see, you know, what they excel in and how we can maximize that while they're in school. Does anyone have any questions um, based on anything we've said? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. You guys are really quiet today. I put the events website in the chat. We have the recording of the event on the on the site, on the site, on the site, on the site, on the oh, site, no, on the Lewis. site, on the site. What's happening to him? <laughs> so he's he's, he's, he's a DJ. Lewis tonight. Is he rapping on purpose like that? <laughs> no, no. His, something's wrong with his uh, computer. Right. Oh, I was like, right. that's right. not right. acceptable. So <laughs> I put the the website link for the oh. uh, for the event in the chat. You can see the recording of the event there, and all of the um, links, the PowerPoint that was shared, and also some frequently asked que some questions that were asked that we answer on the uh, on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Lewis. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, I don't hear it, so I don't know. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> Christine, I saw you. You were you were mixing. <laughs> oh my goodness. We told we told Lewis to wear some headphones. Today. I'll, I'll hear it in the recording. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so we have one more speaker tonight, but in the meantime, we can bombard Miss Domingo with uh, questions that we have since we have you for a few more moments. Nobody, where is Tiffany? Tiffany, can you please ask me a question? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Would you like me to ask you? Yeah. Would you like me to ask you? <laughs> Tiffany, ask me a question. Um, what are you doing for the holidays? <laughs> Hopefully oh, something good, like relaxing. I don't relax. For some reason, I have become in charge of the holiday. Never, I hate it. <laughs> I do all the cooking. But yeah, I'm really excited to spend uh, the, the following week relaxing. Just being in my slippers, right? Yes, that's home. good. I think we all, we all need a break. Yeah. These breaks are really like, oh, I love these breaks. You know, Thanksgiving break and then now the holiday break. It's a nice little break to kind of rejuvenate yourself and then come back in the new year. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a good question. Is the rumor about the new chancellor wanting to make the school every day for a full year true? 
I, I have not. not heard that one. I've heard a lot of rumors, but you know, I will say um, anything that we hear and we learn about the, the, the chancellor's priorities will be part of my conversation with you. I mean, if you've watched some of the things that he has talked about, he really, um, I, and I said this to the principal, he has a lot of similar beliefs that we do, right? He talks about not just looking at a test, about knowing all learners, about being held accountable and responsible for the work that we do and to ensure that our students are growing and learning, you know? Um, so I am really excited to hear what's coming up next in the DOE. You know, I think that um, with every change, what we do together as a community is we talk about it and we take it and we make it uh, work for our schools. Like we've, I just think about how far we've come, um, you know, from, you know, 2010 when I first started and we, we really do a lot of amazing work together for our children, right? And, you know, look, the, the thing that I will say um, is I'm really proud of all of us. I'm proud of you parents. I'm proud of our teachers. I'm proud of our principals because in the midst of all this chaos, our students are still learning, right? As difficult as it is, I've been going into classrooms and it is there, you know, like I'm still holding them accountable. We're still having those really good conversations. We're still having professional learning in our relationships with Apple. We're doing, um, you know, task work with Apple. We're still training our teachers in math. We're still doing um, some solid vocabulary work. We're doing work on cultural, being culturally responsive. Um, we're, we're doing it, you know, we're doing it. We're pushing through because I, I basically said in the beginning of the year, I'm, District 25 is not falling behind. We're gonna be ready and up there when, this, when we come out of this pandemic. We're gonna keep going and that's, so, and that's really what we're doing. Danielle, we had a speaker from Brilliant New York City come to a CPAC meeting um, and they uh, were, wanted to hear feedback from parents of what they can add to the program. Mm -hmm. And I know that I spoke about um, adding arts. Like if we're so worried about our mental health of the children, these kids need an outlet to express themselves or through art. And if they feel good about themselves or, or know that they're going to go to an art class after this math lesson or after uh, an, an ELA lesson, it kind of puts them in a, in a place where they're more willing to learn to get to the next thing. So they did mention that they were looking into um, putting more arts into that program because they see the importance because we, you know, it always arts is always the first thing that's cut every time there's like funding cuts because they think, oh, arts is not that important. And I think people are starting to realize through this pandemic how important the arts was right? Because yeah. that's what really kept us going through the pandemic was our televisions and the actors and the poetries and, and anything, anything that could visually stimulate us. And um, um, I'm glad to see that that's going to be part of Brilliant New York City. Yep. And, and you know what, actually, Francis, it's a conversation that many of you should have with your principals, because I am, I was pleasantly surprised to see how many of our schools still captured um, the arts as part of their programming this year, mm -hmm. how dance is still happening, how chorus is still happening, um, how band is still happening, all in, you know, socially distanced and safe ways. But it was something that was valued by our leaders. And so many, many of our schools are still um, working with the outside partnerships and community-based organizations to ensure that the arts are still there. Okay, so while we waiting for Shirley, uh, she should be on soon. I'm just going to open up to any um, questions for Danielle or any questions that you may have that maybe about your PTA or anything like that. Deborah. I was just wondering what other PTAs are doing for programming this year. Because I have an awesome programming person on my board, um, and we could use some ideas. Does anyone have anything? You know, it's fun, it's funny you say that, Deborah. That, uh, when a, a couple of meetings ago, people were asking what is programming, because I was talking about it like it was. And in our school, two hundred nine. I have to say they're very much into the arts, and that's one of the greatest things I liked about the school. They really value 
the arts and the shows and anything music or, I mean they still have an original music teacher which a lot of schools don't have so um we're struggling with the, with the programming this year usually because it's everything has to be outdoors um and then it becomes a little costly but we're in talks with people we we did speak to Ali Pond Environmental Center who's willing to do uh stuff outdoors and they bring animals to the kids and and, and it's a great experience and they usually give us a good price you know uh, because the more classes that you do so that's something that we're considering um, we're also considering an in-house residency so that maybe a, a, a visual, I'm sorry, not visual, a teaching artist will come and teach them a dance and maybe they have an end of year performance. And of course, because of the social distancing, we have to do it in a way where everyone is safe. But um, we are definitely working that, but we are curious to see if anyone has anything planned uh, for any type of programming assemblies or anything like that. We did have, um, for those of you, last year we had in our school a virtual arts program where we had a virtual teacher come in and teach the children how to draw. Or and, and it was pretty successful, I have to say. There were some scheduling issues, you know, because there were so many classes. But I have to say, it was a really nice experience. And we kind of kept the kids' um, artwork in a little folder that we gave them with little googly eyes on them and to kind of create their own portfolio because we wanted them to feel like artists and to see them progressing each week with a new piece of art. And it was really nice. They really enjoyed it. And, um, and then what else did we do? I think that was it. That was the virtual and we did it for the whole school. So each grade had an own, their own art work that they would do, you know, per, as like the pre-K obviously had a different, as the grades got older, they drew like maybe um, comic book characters and stuff like that. So it got a little bit more intense as they got older, which they appreciated it. You know, um, Francis, something that I have to say that we don't think about because it's not what we're used to and we shouldn't live here forever. But what I do know is um, a lot of our kids are doing really well with virtual anything, the arts you know, or virtual anything exercise, you know, like kids just like to get up and do things. And, and if you have somebody who, you know, has uh, the ability to work in schools and is extremely animated, like I know you had that beatbox guy last year. Um, I don't know if he's ever, if he was ever able to, to work in the schools, but, you know, just people that are animating can get kids excited. And even if they're doing their work at their desk, they are responsive to virtual learning very different than, than we may be. So something that PTAs may want to consider is, um, and I'm just kind of throwing it out there. I'm thinking as a PTA person, not now as a principal, but like making sure that the materials are in the class for each student and then having the person come on so they can build it. Like, you know what I did this weekend, which I thought was really cool. Jones Beach does this and it's only $4 a person, right? So you go in there and you make wreaths and what they do is they like clip, I know you can't really do this, but they clip things from, um, you know, as they trim and they, you know, get pine and pine cones and all that stuff. And and we, I went there with my daughter and, and we made a wreath. And so many people were there with like their grandkids, like little kids. And then a few weeks ago we went, here, look, I'll show you. <laughs> um, we made Christmas candles. <laughs> so like, can you see? No. I can't. Can you see like a little pine cone on top? So like, just think about things like that that can be done, you know, socially distanced, but kids like it, you know? So I definitely encourage you. And this one's Bayberry. <laughs> so um, they taught us all about candle making and, um, but there's a lot of different events out there that could be, that could be accessible to students that, maybe we can organize as PTAs to say like each kid gets a little baggy of whatever they're going to do. I, I think was it, I think it was college point, um, something community. I think they have this organization where they were giving out gingerbread houses. You would pick them up 
And then they would have a Zoom event where everybody did their gingerbread house from their home. You know, a cookie decorating, you know, just something to do together, you know, just be creative, things to think about. Okay, here's the question. Does anyone have any experience registering their school as Amazon Smile Organization for Amazon to donate a portion of parents' purchase to school? I'll give that question to Deborah. Deborah? <laughs> do you know? I, was doing, I was doing second grade math. We, um, <laughs> we, we don't actually do Amazon Smile, but we looked into it. It is fairly easy. Um, I think Mia had looked into it, Francis, but it wound up when we transitioned with parent coordinators, we lost like the stop and shop, the Amazon smile and no one picked it back up. So unfortunately I don't have, um, I know looking into it, it, can, it comes up, across as easy enough, but I don't know, um, I don't know much about it. I'm sorry. Does anyone? Would, no you have to be a 501c3. Oh, you have to be a 501c3? Yes. So, Sarah, I'm not sure if your school is a 501c3, but you would have to be that to participate. And someone had asked, um, do, you have, do you have any good coding class recommendations? And Deborah put in the chat, uh, www.decoderschool.com. Yeah, they're in Whitestone or Bayside. They're, they're fairly new. They... they I think they opened up about a year before the pandemic officially took off. So I know that they're they're really reaching out to schools right now and they're trying to expand their business a little bit. They I think they started at a bad time, but then they discovered that coming into the schools and doing different virtual programs with schools was going to benefit them as well as us. So they're they're awesome over there. I would definitely give them a call. Alexa. That was uh that was us and me and virtual every time there was oh, the, and the, name, the girl in the class named that I don't want to say because then mine will go off and every time they called this girl's mm, name that. see that and then they, they my Alexa kept going off every time so he's checking his math homework because I I can't answer him so he's asking her <laughs> <laughs> that's when that's when it becomes sad when we get replaced by <laughs> parents get replaced by machines. Um, I was just going to say something um, with the websites and I just, it took, it took my mind off of it. Okay. Anyone else has any questions for Danielle? Everyone's pretty quiet tonight. They're ready for the holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anyone getting any questions from their parent, you know, parents in their schools or anything? I mean, we haven't re really received that many questions um, lately. I guess more when we get into. Oh, election. I do know what I want to talk about. Ooh. While I'm here. So tomorrow I am having a principal meeting. Really, 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 really important. Um. I know that you guys all heard about the TikTok challenge, this crazy nonsense that went on out there, you know, in the country. And, um, you know, so I, I'm going to ask all of my principals to have town hall meetings, but this is really, really important parents. We, we have to start having conversations with our students about social media. I know last year, Lewis did a presentation for you and Francis, you might want to have him do it again for our new members around having a positive online profile. Lewis, what is that what it's called? I know you say how to be a good digital citizen. Yep. Yeah. The, the digital Correct. citizenship. Yep. Yeah. Now, let me say this to you, everyone. What's really important is that if your children right now in the current state, since the TikTok challenge, make threats, threaten violence, show pictures of guns, which kids are doing. Um, the schools have to do three things. They have to call the police. They have to tell their level three in the school and they have to uh, notify myself, the borough and central offices. So the police have come, they are taking it very seriously. Um, there are kids who have created 
um, different types of accounts that are not real. Um, and it's not just one particular school, it's in, in a few schools. Once again, the police do full investigations. They're able to find these people. Um, it is very serious. It is coming to a place where um, we need to work together to make sure that our kids understand that when you are online, it is the same thing as when you're in person and things you say, how you act, how you present yourself and, and how you treat other people is taken very seriously. So kids cannot just go online and say whatever they want. It doesn't work like that because, you know, although we know our kids and we know how they, we, we have good kids, you know, our, all of our kids are good. And I'm sure we could say, look, look at that one behind you, Deborah. I'm sure he's a great kid. Um, but, but we, they need to understand that not everybody knows them the way we do, you know? And so when they say certain things, it is taken very seriously. I told my kids, I learned years ago, my son is eight, he's gonna be 19, he's right here. I told him, you say one dangerous thing, you put up one bad picture, you lose your phone for life. Very dangerous, kid. <laughs> yes, Very I, dangerous. I told him. So he knew, <laughs> he knew I never had to worry about that. I'm not really on the phone. Danielle, no. do they do this citizen, uh, digital citizenship as part of the curriculum oh, yeah. for maybe um, elementary or middle school or high school kids? I think they should start in elementary. So I think like, I feel it's very important. This is a very important topic since I'm, I'm in a middle school, right? Not me personally, but <laughs> my kids are, but um, they do start like Roblox, all of that. That's a social media game. They're already okay. out there with people in like first grade. I feel like once they have an iPad, we as parents, as the adults in their lives need to speak to our children about this. It's so important. Yeah. I we put the link, I put the link in the in the chat to what the DOE offers for digital citizenship. And there are resources both for families to do at home. And it's mm -hmm. it's broken into two groups. It's you have uh, resources for younger students, 12 and younger, and then uh, 12 and then 13 and up. And um then there's also to answer your question, Francis. There's there's things that teachers can use in the classroom. So um, I wouldn't really say it's a curriculum, but it is definitely lessons that they can incorporate in the classroom. I mean, uh, and look, I I will say to you, it's it's we need to check our kids' social media. I I yes. was guilty. I was guilty myself. We did we did a district presentation, and I googled my daughter, and she came up, and it turns out that one of her friends wasn't private because I make my kids be yes. private. One of her friends was in private and all of a sudden all these pictures of my daughter came up. And I said to her, I was like, you cannot even be friends with people that are in private. Like that I had to say as a parent, right? But I mean, even, even saying you need to be friends with somebody you know, like something as simple yeah. as that, because then, you know, like there's, there's kids now who's like, oh, I want, I, I, I want, the more followers I get, the better it is, right? No, they, I think we need to teach parents how to talk to the kids as well, yeah. not alone just teach the kids. Yeah, we, I tell my son when he first got his phone, which was when he went to middle school, um, because there was a police officer who came to our school and said that kids in elementary school shouldn't have phones. It should be in, yeah. in middle school because they're a little bit more mature and can handle but I told him, I'm going to trust you until I can't trust you anymore on this phone. So you have to, they have to earn their trust. If I see something that's inappropriate, then it's gone. But I also want to say this. Um, I want you guys to think about when we were younger and you used to get in a fight with someone, how difficult it was to go up to them and say something mean. And a lot of times I stopped myself because I was like, oh, I can't say it even though I want to, right? Like, <laughs> you know, but... These kids today, they don't have to do that. They can just put something online and they never actually have to see the person's face when they say something. That's how we learned empathy and sympathy, right? I learned by saying like, I cannot look this person in the face even though right now I'm really angry and say this, right? And, and when you put something, you know, you do this through your phone and you're completely disconnected, and that's and that's what we also have to talk about being a safe digital citizen is one thing how you present yourself but it's also about how you treat others and i don't think we talk about that enough because a lot of what is happening is kids can't even be on social media some kids because kids just attack them right and say things and all it takes is one person and we've talked about this like i see this on my you know my own town's facebook stuff 
right? One person goes on there and says something stupid. And then like everybody agrees and says silly things and then somebody disagrees mm -hmm. and then they fight. And that's adults, you know? Like. Yeah, and especially anything that's written in like message wise, uh -huh. everybody reads it in their own tone and then they take it into a different, you know, into a, it snowballs into a different thing. So even as adults, it's already hard enough. So I can't even imagine with kids. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when, when, when my kids started playing Roblox, I went, I was that parent where I sat down and I went to go play it. And um, somebody you know, in the game knocked me because I wasn't like, I was like, you know, I'm that person that's standing there like this at the wall. <laughs> and, and this person just called me the B word, you know? And I was like, Oh my God, what are these, what are these first graders doing? And why did they just curse at me? So we definitely have to watch out for what they're doing and teach them the responsibilities of it. Cause they're definitely like uh, Mr. Mango is saying, it's so much easier to be rude, you know, than it. And plus you don't know if that's like a 300 pound like person who's pretending to, to be a little kid. <laughs> that's what you yeah. have to tell, tell yeah. kids too. You know, you don't know who, that there's catfishing. There's all these things out there that those are things we do have to talk to them about because I mean, it, it is awkward, but it's important to have that conversation. And even if they're in kindergarten, Mm -hmm. you know, so I feel like we should really work together to do this before like and start in elementary before it gets out of, you know. Gets and, yeah. And I think that's definitely a, a parent school relationship. I need to say, though, as a superintendent, you know, because it's been happening a lot, like there really is no tolerance for it. And I don't want to see kids engaging in something and. And the, the first thing that happens to them is they get a suspension, right? Like we want to be able to say, and that's why I'm saying to, you know, principals tomorrow, I want you to have a parent town hall, but I also want you to really start spending time. Like you were saying, Christine, talking to kids in classes and really talking about like who we are digitally and what kind of person we want to be seen as in a safe way, which is a lot of what we're saying. And, and when we talked about digital citizenship, it was about for individual student safety, but now we're saying it as, as a digital communicator and, and, and how we treat others online. And I definitely know because I was a parent like this too, like we should, you know, discuss like ways, cause I struggled too, you know, I was a working mom. I got my kids a phone. There were no more flip phones. If I had a choice, I would get a flip phone, but now you can't even I get a I still want to get the flip phone. <laughs> so my kids, my kids were in fifth grade and they had iPhones. And you know what? It was way too soon for them to have it, but it was sometimes the only way I could get in touch with them because I was working. And I think a lot of people, a lot of parents fall into that world, like not realizing what they had access to. And, and so the rules and boundaries, like now I tell my, my son, like, I'm tracking you. I'm 360ing you. I pay for you know your car insurance. I want to see how fast you go. You don't like it, then give me your phone and give me your car. You pay for yourself. You know, like now I'm doing that. I didn't do that when the kids were younger, but I learned, you know, to say like, all right, then you pay your own car insurance because you're you know killing me with it anyway. So you can pay it yourself, and I'm gonna track that. You know, and if you don't like it, you're an adult. Go ahead. So. So that's, that's really where, you know, I know a lot of that comes from me, you know? And so when my son is speeding, I call him up. I'm like, come home, you know, <laughs> if you can't drive regularly, come home. So, so I think like we need to say, I know it's, it's a break for us. I'm just speaking for myself. When my kids were on their phones, it was a break for me. You know, I was like, oh God, I get a break. But we really need to, to tell them. You want, you want a phone? I need your password. That's it. I got to look at your stuff. So. I have, I see um, Kayu Lam. It, they, ha they had their hand up for a while. So I just want to give you the floor. Hi, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the first time um, co-president this year at um, PS163. I have a question regarding um, the EIN number. Maybe you guys can give me some insights of it. Um, our member was suggesting getting donation from outside sources uh, or some donation match from the organization. 
Um, so we were deciding, um, should we have our own P PTA EIN number or we can just use the school EIN number? I believe uh, that each PTA has their own. Yeah, you don't share the one. The school's is theirs and you have to have your PA PTA. Are, are, you, um, asking, are you asking because you want to give a, a tax deductible? Is that what it is? Yeah, because um, 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 during the meeting, um, the member was suggesting, um, if we get donation match this year, and then how, uh, after we got the um, EIN number, so we have to file tax every year, even though we don't um, hire anyone, or uh, let's say we don't get um, donation for a year, then we still have to file tax, right? If you're a 5013C, yes. Oh, okay. But 5013C, is it for the um, uh, nonprofit? Yeah. yeah, so I believe, there was only, I believe there was only one PAPTA that went that route, and now mm -hmm. they're trying to go back to not being a 5013C because once those parents that started the 5013C, they moved on, the following mm -hmm. parents didn't have the success, you know, of getting exactly. the money so mm -hmm. it, you know, you're left with that. So that's why it's, if you, if your school wants to go into a 5013C, it's more complicated than it looks because you do have to yeah. hire an accountant and you have, you have to, to file have taxes. paperwork and file taxes. Now, once those parents that are in charge of that graduate and that information is not left, then the exactly. new board has to deal with it. So, yes, yes. Can the, so, Esther, can the, um, the, can the okay. donation be given to the school directly? Yes. Um, but you know, we have 50, 50 members voting on it. We, they, uh, most of us, um, believe we should have our own EIN. So you do um, as a PAPTA, you should have your own EIN, uh, N number. Okay. So after we have the EIN number, um, can we do the, um, um, the tax filing ourselves or we have to hire the uh, accountant to do that? So are you a 5013C? No, we are okay. not. Doing you don't have to right. do. They, they, you don't do taxes. Yeah. Oh, we don't do taxes at all. No, only have. only if you're a five hundred one three C. The oh, the requirements okay. under that, if you went to go Google it, you'll have to do taxes. There's certain ways that you have to keep your documents in the order to, that, to function. The, the only thing that your PAPTA is responsible is to submit your numbers in January and at the end of the Thank year. You. And make okay, sure that you communicate with your principal of everything that you plan to do at the school. I believe, though, um, I believe, though, just to to be uh, clear, is that if your school makes or raises over fifty thousand dollars, technically, uh -huh. you're yeah. supposed to file taxes. But many of our PTAs don't no. because most of the money that we get, we spend. It's like we get in, we spend. We we never. There's never a profit, you know what I mean? There's always a yeah. we spend right on the school. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, after we get a donation, we usually uh, have to purchase the supplies for the student yeah, you um, or, or spend on the um, activities. Yeah. So that's um, why it's not something that it's like, you know, nothing that's really enforced unless it becomes a problem. Then mm -hmm. people will look at it and dissect it. But mm -hmm. um, every... Every PTA has an EIN number. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have a bank account for your PTA, so that's a yes, tax your EIN number. Mm -hmm. Sometimes oh no, we don't. Easy. We don't have a EIN number. I already double check today because um, I just. How, how were you able to open up the bank account? I what have score no are you? Idea, but, um, PS one sixty three, and I was, you know, this is the first time, and. It, you know, we tried to talk to the previous president and nobody have any idea about the <laughs> accounts. What do they have? Except I would, the I would no bank accounts or anything? No, 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 no. We have the bank yeah. account. I, would yeah. I have to search all this information myself um, mm -hmm. because last year they didn't do anything because of the pandemic mm -hmm. um, or they don't have some, they have no uh, knowledge or idea about how to go about this. Issue. Okay. You so should be able to check with your bank. Yeah, you can the check bank say you. that we have a business account, but we don't have it. Yeah, and I even I even called the IRS, and then the IRS told me that no, you guys doesn't have the EIN number. Hmm. 
So, so I'm sure you must have had because all our PAPTAs um, back when um, Don Acevedo was the president, she double checked that everybody had one. Um, oh. and all the schools had one. There is a phone number that I'm trying to look so that you could call and double check. I don't know if that's the one that you called. But okay. when Don Acevedo was the president of President's Council, she went ahead and that was one of the things that she did. And it's right here. Also, I want oh. to say okay. uh, that I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. And oh. also, um, when when um, our principal gave us the um, EIN number of the school, oh. we couldn't search that um, the EIN. The numbers belong to PS 163. Does it show the VA number uh, to a specific school or is for just for um, New York City? So your the school is going to have their own EIN number and the PAPTA. So if you're calling, they're going to say the school or your PAPTA. You're supposed to use your PAPTA and not use the schools. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, the school just gave us the the school EIN number, and when we tried so to so that is incorrect. Topic, so I will give you that. Yes, that is um, okay. Yeah, please go ahead and give me the. I'm putting it in the chat right now. So just give me a second, and then and you can I will. I will say that every PTA has to keep a folder, keep documents for about six years. If not seven, is it six or seven? Six, six. I think six. 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 It's yeah, six years. So. So that information, you know, yeah, it should always be there. I believe in our school we had that issue too. Somehow the EIN, but we finally either, if you can't find it, then you might have to apply for a new one. I believe. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing is, you need your own. And a lot of the times I hear like uh, we don't really reimburse for taxes, but sometimes a lot of the stores don't accept our tax exempt form. So um, we, we, we recommend that you use stores that do accept it. But if they don't, we understand parents will spend the mm -hmm. money and then you can reimburse them for whatever the amount was. Um, okay. So, yeah, I, I definitely. And, and, and if it seems like you want to just at this time, try to organize as much as you can and yes. keep these uh, files for anyone who comes after you to make mm -hmm. it easier for them. We actually did in our school, we, we made um, like a little, like a booklet that kind of showed every single role and how to do it well. Mm -hmm. and, and some ideas so that whoever comes in there will have a good idea of doing that. And it, and it, it seems very helpful because mm -hmm. um, it's really just for the school and for the kids and for parents yeah. to come in since there's no really experience that you come in with other than being a parent. Uh, Janet, you had a question. Oh, you know what? I was just going to jump in and say that we're having the same issue and that I cannot locate an EIN number for ourselves either. And my, our bank told me we don't have one. So I feel like her and I should communicate on how we um, go about it. We, I, we have a lawyer that happens to be on our board. So she's looking into how to get one. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, it's interesting that we, we I had the same exact experience. So the information's on the chat. That's the number. Um, so a lot of times when you call, you give them the information and they're, go they're able to go ahead and give you that number. Um, okay. Part of that number should be part of the things that you hand out in June that you hand over to the next incoming board that comes in. That mm -hmm. should be along with your bank account information. Your EIN number should be part of the information that's passed on to the incoming uh board and so that that's why you should all have a folder with all the information in there okay that was supposed to be handed over to you um and i understand and probably not but um moving forward now you know that for the incoming board um it is courtesy that we go ahead and give them a folder with all the information um and you could make it as elaborate as you want um your PAPTA uh, flyer with all the information, then your president's council um, information uh, goes together for the month of, let's say, December. Then you go to January and all goes together. So that means your incoming 
PAPTA is able to know what happened in January at 1SPS-163 and what happened in January at President's Council. So it's mm -hmm. together and it's information that you pass. Say your new board is completely new and has no idea, but if you have those that information for them, they're able to see that PS-163 had a book sale and they went ahead and fundraised you know, $3,000. So then you have that idea. Or if you're at 209, you're able to see that, you know, Deborah has how she did that silent auction. And that's yeah. one thing that you're able to go ahead and do because they made what, 17,000, 18,000? So yeah, that's something that. Different. So, um, if, um, reach out the numbers on the chat. Call them up and they'll go ahead and um, help you out. Okay, um, by the end of the school year, how much, uh, how much is the amount that we have to leave in the account for the next coming board? Well, I mean- Depends okay. on the board, I mean, it depends on the school. Oh, it depends on the school? It depends on what you guys do in the beginning of the year. Like if you have a if you have a store and you need to load up your store, how much money does it take to at least purchase the first load up of the store? It depends, you know, basically what you know what you want to do. But we shouldn't have um, more than how much was that? Five thousand yeah. unallocated funds. So, so you want to go ahead and have, uh, you know, leave a significant amount to start the new PAPTA, but you don't want to leave them $20,000 because if you raise that money, you want to go ahead and use those $20,000 for the children of that school year that you raise money for. And you want to go ahead and leave a significant amount. Like um, Christine said, if you have a store and you know that every month you you need to spend i don't know five hundred dollars to supply the supplies in there you want to leave them at least two months so they could go ahead and start fundraising or whatever else your budget proposed budget was if you're having you know if you're helping fifth grade graduation how much is that going to make sure that that money goes to there if you have a significant amount over you might want to talk to your principal asking them if there's anything that the papta you know mm -hmm. 21 22 school year 2021 school year could buy the papta because you were so successful and you want to go ahead and the principal might say hey can you buy the planners for the incoming school year and then you take it back and you vote on it and um spend your money that way okay thank you very much they, there should be a budget from last year that you can actually look and follow to see the expenses that you had throughout the year to kind of help you gauge, like in our school, we had the, the red communication folders that, that we use for communicating between parents and teachers. So we spent about, I think about 500 to $1,000 just on that. So that was always put aside and we always started our fifth grade with $2,500. Uh, so yeah, we do little things like that, but definitely what Christine said, don't leave more than 5,000 because parents, you know, donate to, to, to give it to the student. And then that student graduates, they didn't get, you know, access to those funds. So we definitely don't want to have all this money. But I know with the pandemic, it's been a little bit tricky because there were funds that needed to be spent. Um, but we're still going to need it, you know, to, to give back to the school in some way for the, for the students. Um, okay. And now I uh, thank you so much for your question. Anybody else has any questions? Now I see someone guest here. I don't know if Shirley's here. I don't know if that's Shirley or is it someone else? I don't know. It's just, if there are no other questions of me, I'm going to hop off, okay? Okay. Does anybody have any final questions from Mrs. Domango? She's a hot item. You better take, take it <laughs> out. I mean, I got to get it. Until All right, everyone. Out. Listen, have a great holiday, and I'll see you in 2022. Thank okay. you. See you next year. <laughs> Bye. 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 Enjoy. Um, so I don't know if Shirley is here. I see guest, but I don't know if that's Shirley. Shirley, is that you? No. I would think Shirley would rename herself, but maybe it's not her. Um, there was another question. Go ahead. I don't see a question in the chat. You mean somebody raised their hand? They did. I, maybe they left. I don't know. I thought I, I saw a hand up.
Okay. So um, we were still waiting for one more presenter, but I, I don't see that they are here today. Um, I know that they were doing uh, another um, election and they had also, she had also sent me an email saying that she never received the link. I sent her at about five o'clock telling her that you have to go on the D25 site and I sent her the link. So I hope that she received that on time. You don't have any um, no, other no. way with her, no phone number. Okay. No, so I we'll don't. Wait, and it, you know what? If she can't make it tonight, we'll have her come back the next meeting. You know, if um, not, I could go ahead and present next time. Um, also. Oh, okay. I also put the parent uh, university uh, link. If you could go ahead and um, is that Lewis? I hear like a little echo. Um, <laughs> go ahead and uh, I know now I'm all like paranoid. Um, go ahead and sign up for the parent university. You get a lot of information there, and the video should be there for the presentation that Face had about all the updates that were done to A660. Some of the ones that I could tell you top hand, if I could have a minute really quick, is that one of the things, um, and I know she's gonna give you more details, but what I could tell you is that now, every time that you look at your A660, A660, the chances regulation, make sure that the date on there is November 18th, 2021. The last time that they were updated was I don't have the exact date, but um, it's been a while. Yeah. So let me go ahead and just give you the highlights. So the last time that they were updated was January 19th, 2017. And um, let me just give you um, some of the highlights. So some of the highlights that PAPTAs are gonna be able to implement is choices between in-person meetings, virtual or hybrid. So you could go ahead and do virtual, which is exactly what we're doing here, or you could do in person if that is permitted. And you gotta remember that we have to follow CDC guidelines and school guidelines. That means all parents must be vaccinated and you have to um, follow all the rules. Or you could go ahead and have hybrid, which is a little bit of uh, it's both in person and on computer. But just because you could do that, you gotta be able, you gotta make sure that you're savvy enough to go ahead and implement all the stuff, like to be able to connect it, um, so that the parents at home are able to see and the parents in home. So it takes a little bit of time. Lewis taught us how to do it here for uh, CEC. Um, and then now eligibility for membership has been expanded to include your parents. Um, if your school has a 3K and a pre-K, then those parents are now able to be part of your uh, PAPTA. So that's been added. What else? The voting privileges. Let me see, I'm looking at my notes here. I was not prepared to. No uh, voting privileges. Um, for PAPTAs and President's Council have been extended um, to, so basically, if you're in, coming, coming in May, when we have our elections, you're only going to be able to vote, you're only going to be able to have a meeting online to go ahead and vote, which is what we're used to, or in person, but you can have it hybrid. So you can't, you're not gonna be able to do both. You know, your elections have to be clear and define what they're gonna be. Um, I suggest, you know, we all do virtually like we've been doing it cause we're all used to it, but you do have a choice. If you wanna do it in, in, in school, then that's a choice, but you cannot do a hybrid for voting. Remember that all your notice for your mail, um, your uh, flyers need to indicate how, what location and how you guys are going to meet, just like your uh, president's council um, flyer has where it's going to be. It's virtually and it has the email address so parents can log on. Um, let me see, quorum now. You have to be careful that if it's for a hybrid meeting, you have to have at least one executive board member in attendance or on the school premises. Quorum for the uh, either in-person or VRP meeting requires at least two executive board members and six members from the general membership. Uh, let me see what else. Um, 
Okay, so now they're talking about, they also did a lot of correction to bank information. So the PAPTAs may utilize access bank accounts through online porters providing, uh, provided by the bank institute. So now you could go online and check your status. Um, but you always wanna go back to the basic, you know, try to use your check, be as simple as possible. Now you could go ahead, if a vendor is not taking a check because they're all moving to the virtual world, you could then go ahead and use your uh, card to go ahead and pay that vendor. Um, so you may utilize bank debit cards to pay for goods and services to vendors in certain circumstances, but withdrawals slips should never be, uh, you know, so say you're a parent that you put $20 to go ahead and buy the cupcakes needed. You cannot then go ahead and take your T, uh, the card and go withdraw the $20 to pay yourself. You have to follow procedure and policy. That means you need to get a check with the two signatures, with your reimbursement, and there has to be a sign, you know, Esther Maluto is getting reimbursed for $20 at BJ's for cupcakes for the sale. And two signatures, whoever your two signatures on your board are, and then you go ahead and get your check from your um, your treasurer. Uh, let me see. So we know that in turn, um, we know the term in person refers to on the school premises. We know that virtual remote platform, which is VRP, refers to remote platforms using, um, you know, meetings like this. And as you all know, all the PAPTAs have access to the um, Department of Education Zoom account, which is not does not time you. And you can go over an hour because if you use the free one, it's only an hour. So you always want to have that security that you have more than enough time to go ahead and use um, the Zoom without worrying that you're going to be cut off in an hour. Um, other school, other PAPTAs use the WebEx or the Google Meets. Um, it is suggested that you use, recommended that you use the Zoom um, link to your PAPTA um, email account. Uh, okay, let me see what else. I'm pretty sure I'm skipping stuff. Be, um, so remember that at the beginning of the school year, your executive board must survey the parents to determine the day, time, location, and format, whether they want in person, virtually, or hybrid for um, the monthly meetings for your PAPTA. Uh, I told you about the elections. They could either be conducted in person or virtually, but they cannot be hybrid when it comes to voting. Let me see. Um, Esther, uh, um, it's being said in the in the chat. Can you post the link to print the new A six sixty? Sure. Um, let me see. I tried going on to print it, but it keeps telling me that there's an error. So right I now, to have I a know. New I know that the A660 bylaws, if you know, when you go on there, there's like all the languages, the DOE languages right now, you could only find the English one because they're translating all of them. But I'll go ahead and post it right now. If you give me a minute, I'm just trying to see what else. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I tried looking for it. And so it one of the other things they want to make sure is that you know that linking the PAPTA or president's bank account to your own personal Bank account is prohibited. That's a big no-no. Um, Sharon's here. She did a presentation. Maybe she wants to add some stuff. Um, remember that PAPTAs may re receive and use a bank debit card for the sole purpose of paying a vendor for goods or services. For example, when a vendor does not accept a physical check or is online. So basically now, before we would ask you to please destroy that card and not use it, now with the A660 update, you could go ahead and use that debit card for the sole purpose of um, paying a vendor who does not take uh, your checks. So Bank I and debit cards uh, must be received, approved by the general membership. Remember, everything has to be approved. You just don't run with your new debit card. So remember that there must be a distribution form that must accompany your transactions and signed by two uh, officers. 
Let me see what else. So we know that the bank card and debit cards must not be used for the following items. They cannot be used for third party mobile applications, um, direct donations, out of pocket reimbursement, cash withdrawals from the ATM, receive cash back or cash refund. Um, remember that these will be violations and um, it can it may result in in immediate removal from, um, as an officer, um, according to the chancellor's uh, regulations. Let me see. I think that's it. And remember that now is a good time to go ahead. I know that also the bylaws are the template is being updated on the DOE website. Once you download that template, you're going to be able to um, add all the changes. Remember that your bylaws should be reviewed every three years and say you just updated your bylaws last month. Well, you could always, your bylaws can always be reviewed. And so now, I mean, renewed, so or change or amend. Um, so now everybody's gonna have to update their bylaws because of all the changes that happen because you need to clearly state how are you gonna have your meetings? Where are you gonna have your meetings, you know? And that's about it of the highlights that I have. Um, I hope I'm not missing anything. Um, remember that the resources for this are the Chancellor's Regulation A660, the bylaws template, and the implementation policy guide related, um, related to amendment Chancellor Regulation A660. I'll drop, I'll drop all those in the chat right now. Give me a minute. And I just want to add on that the debit cards, you should really try to minimize it since there's no way of, you know, you have to then add on that invoice where you have to say what you're using it for. It was really done for the times that people couldn't, didn't have access to the checks because of they couldn't get into the schools and vendors weren't getting paid. But now we have access to the schools uh, for those parents who can go in. So I would always recommend the checks. There's an easier way of tracking and it's just better to maneuver that way. So remember the debit cards are really just in those types of cases, which at this point they should be minimized unless there's another uh, closure of some sort. Also the signature. So if there's co-presidents, okay? So that's a co, let's say there's two co-presidents, they're considered one signer. So if, 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 if let's say you, you can have two co-signers sign one check and be considered two separate signatures. Although you're two separate um, people, you cannot, it's, you're still one body, if that makes sense. So if it's a, co you could have one co-president sign and then have another, another person who's, who's a signer sign as well. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if Shirley's coming in now. But she just sent me an email that said, no problem, thank you. Well, we could table it and you could, um, you know. I mean, I, I re responded with her. She just responded now saying, no problem, thank you. But I don't know what that means. She comes now. It's like the meeting's almost over. So tell her to come back in. It's up to you. I don't know. I don't know if she's coming in, but we, you know, I we can save her for January, so it could be a fresh start to the year. Yeah, we'll you know. we'll do. If she comes. We'll just let her know. All right. So, um, I'd be having Beacon coming next year. Uh, next year too. And we have um, Lou. Like, well, no, I think he's coming February. And if you have any ideas out there of who we, what kind of speakers we can um, have, and if you have access to them, let us know because we, we always try to try to give you a good agenda so that you can come and learn something new or get some information. So, uh, does anybody have any questions for Esther or myself or Christine or anyone? Okay, so at this time, if no one has any questions, I'll, I'll put in a motion to end the meeting. It's 8.33. Can I get someone else to second it? I second I put, it. 
What'd you say, Esther? I put the A660 and the implementation policy guideline. Okay. Um, I don't that. have the template yet. But that's the latest A660. Uh, make sure that every time you open it, um, it says November 18th, 2021. Um, I don't have the template yet. Let me see where is it. Hold on a second. Give me. Um, so I put the A660 in the implementation policy guideline, but I don't have the bylaws template yet. As soon as we have that, we will share that with your parent coordinators um, so they could go ahead. But any questions that you have in regards to um, the A660, don't hesitate to ask President's Council or myself, and we'll get you the answer as soon as possible. I don't know if FACE will be having more trainings. Um, Sharon, are you aware? Is Sharon still here? She left. Um, if they're going to be having more trainings, but they were really good and very, very informative, and all the questions that the people asked um, was really, really good to learn. Um, so hopefully in January, they'll have more. If not, we'll make sure that we have a full training for all of you guys here at President's Council. Okay, thank you, Esther. So I don't see any hands up. Any other final questions or comments? Well, I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. Um, thank you again for being parent leaders that you are. You make our district wonderful, and we, for that, we appreciate you. And uh, I want to wish all of you a happy holidays and safe ho and healthy holidays. And at this time, I'm going to um, close the meeting at 8.34. Can I get someone to second that? I second. Thank I you. want to wish all of you a Merry Christmas to everybody who's still here. And have a great New Year's. Be safe. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy new year. Go hang out, Francis.